for devotee, this is immediately becoming invalid or in, in uh, irrelevant uh, because he is directly engaged in Krishna's service under the direction of the spiritual master. That was directly engaged in Krishna's service must be immediately connected under the, the direction of the spiritual master because without a spiritual master one cannot be engaged directly in Krishna's service. So uh, uh, this is of course, when one is blinded by attachment, like Chitra Ketu, bias attachment, but still an attachment, then you can see there is also an undertone there that he is even willing to accuse Yamaraj, which is actually offensive. <laughs> but it's not taken as an offense, it's taken as a, a momentary state, emotional state of being upset. You know, if one is very upset, then you know, one draws conclusions. Females, well, they are not here so we can actually... Okay, oh, they got getting recorded all. <laughs> uh, females are very, 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 very known for that. They, they prematurely conclude on the basis of emotional comfort or miscomfort. Right. You know, uh, this is, this is uh, when sentimentality becomes dominant, then one prematurely concludes. This is, this is quite, you know, so for one can never take it too seriously, you know, yes. I know, I know. Anyway, and this is all just pinky, which is quite actually amazing. But uh, those who I invite, they, they for sure experience the situation. I know. I know what you think. I know you did it. You just have to agree you did it. I know. It's like the verdict was already, you know, uh, issued and uh, no even investigation, there's no proof, there's no evidence, there's nothing. It's just a premature conclusion. No, no, I know, I know. Why? Because I think so. And if you are like husband, you have to, at that point, to be successfully stupid. He says, oh yes, I told you this. I don't know for what, but actually I Hundred percent surrender. This is how the females work on the only one platform, 100 percent Zero introspection. <laughs> <Ooh, ooh. laughs> you know, and of course then there are those very rare Vaishnavis who are in full awareness of this quality. This doesn't mean that the quality is gone. They are just aware of it, which is very exceptional, very exceptional. And you know, and they tell us straightforward. Don't believe what I conclude on the basis of my emotions. When I meet a male who is actually strong enough to say, you know, no, <laughs> this is called mental platform, then actually they appreciate, oh, somebody is saving me from the mental platform. But then essential, essentially, this is for everybody, male, female, they are all endangered by the mental platform. Hearing, the dictation of the mind and drawing conclusions from that. Yeah, ah, yeah, I said. Maya is so tricky, she will even put a tilak and, and obey the Bhagavad Gita. Ah, you see, this is stated here. Because actually, even Chitrakeru's argumentation is not wrong. You know, how can a son, the shloka before, how can a son die before a father? What kind of justice is this? This is not according to the laws of nature. Laws of nature is that the father dies and the son continues and saves the father from hellish regions. You can see Indians coming and they always bring their own rituals and all this and oblations. And this is also why the kings were so desperate to have sons. You know, uh, not only one but many because there were all kshatriyas. So there was a calculation was made from the beginning that probably many will die in a battlefield. So at least one should be left, okay? Who will take over the kingdom? Who will then, you know, save the father from uh, Hellish regions, which as a king is very easily accessible. I mean, you can make so many mistakes in your management because you have power and you are really going to change people's lives. You will send him to death and, and you will reward him and the king is constantly make judgment. This Kshatriya business is terrible because the management is terrible because you constantly have to make judgments. 
So for this American, don't be judgmental, and this, 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 where is this coming from? This is Arjuna said, first chapter of Bhagavad Gita, my dear Krishna, please don't be judgmental. Well, that's the end of Bhagavad Gita, you know. That's the end of Arjuna too. Because <laughs> Krishna is very judgmental. <laughs> Now we should not use Krishna's words for our own benefit. That's another issue, but that's a really separate issue. Krishna is very judgmental. <laughs> he goes right from right from to hell, not to hell. This is that. You know, it's very simple. But sometimes the laws of nature are very intricate. And Chitraketu's argumentation is in very context valid, you know, but actually it's powered by attachment. You know, my son died. Oh, and then the rationality goes. And to a principle there is always a higher principle. Ultimately the highest principle is unconditionally surrender to Krishna. Now of course to a degree one doesn't unconditionally surrender to Krishna, then the other principles come into action. Therefore we don't essentially discourage this Vedic piety. You know, we are not, we are not, you know, uh, you know, violating that. Now, we point, we have to be very careful in our preaching, also not to prematurely install people into positions which they think once again mentally, oh, that's me, I have no obligation to this, and I don't have to do this, and I don't have to do that. And then uh, we create what Prabhupada called disturbance in a society, like connecting it to prematurely taking sanyas. He said, such a man is a disturbance in the society because he is actually assigned himself to a position he cannot handle. He cannot function in this position. And I mean, very simple, it's logic. Just imagine somebody gets prematurely driving license. What a havoc he can create. <laughs> Sentimentally, you look to me like a truck driver. You are a strong man and here is a driving license. You know, you know <laughs> can you imagine what such a man can do? He will go, okay. I like trucks. It's very nice. I am a truck driver. <laughs> he starts the engine and heads for the city traffic, you know, <laughs> leaving just flattened out cars behind, you know, <laughs> until the police catch him and gets him out and say, sorry, you are driving license is not valid. And that happens. If one is prematurely and unlawfully assuming positions one doesn't belong to, so one will be tested. Ultimately, Krishna consciousness is the ultimate reality because it, we will be all tested. Are we that what we pretend to be? There is two factors, time and karma. They will be testing us, you know. Yeah. Time will show when the law of karma comes into action, you know. And the only way it cannot come into action is that we are covered by devotional service and surrender to Krishna. Then Krishna goes, no, 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 he is out there. Then Kama goes in here. Kama is just a servant of Krishna who is no, he's not. Good. This is what happened when Prabhupada was here. Prabhupada had the power to say, you are Brahmacharya. To a boy who just had a sex life two weeks ago. Prabhupada said, You are Brahmacharya. And you know what? He was. You know, someone wanted. All the things went out of the window. <laughs> Girlfriend, bye bye. You know, yeah. And somehow there was so much preaching and so much bliss. It wasn't so difficult. It looked quite unnatural. Prabhupada proudly always quoted the Americans asking his disciples, Are you Americans? Because the change was so radical. It was so. Prabhupada was very proudly quoted how American priests addressed him that you did actually something we can't do. Our churches are empty. And you, out of nothing, made his people dying for God. Practically, locally, dying for God was a concept which was not very difficult in Prabhupada's presence. It looked completely natural. Of course, Prabhupada didn't taught us how to die for God, he taught us how to live for God. But this 100% surrender was not a really strange concept. You started with it. It's not like gradually by following this Vedic ritual and that Vedic ritual and this and that and you become purified and then you get the prana right and then you get the sink. And in a healthy body there is a healthy soul, you know, all this preaching we hear today 
you know, all this first you adjust yourself mentally and then you function socially and you have you have some good 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 amount of money on a bank account, you know, and then uh, then you can be a nice devotee. I mean we agree humbly, we are not there yet fully, maybe. But we are on the right way to get there. First you get the cash, then you get the uh, you know, the, the Ayurveda right, and then you get this Veda right, and then you get this sink, and then you get that sink, and then you can serve Krishna harmoniously, you know, fully surrendered. Really? Hey, show me where is it happening? <laughs> where is this happening? I would, I would like to know one example. One. But I can give you many examples of people who do such a thing for a little while, improve their lives to a certain degree and then they go away. Because the ultimate background of the whole thing is material satisfaction. To find a place in this material world in a form of existence which actually makes my life happy in the material world. As a well-functioning, I can go down there. <laughs> As a well-functioning member of the society, <laughs> being socially uh, happy, situated, they will all like you and you will all like them. And then, you know, and they will be happy because you have a good job, you know. You can switch in Hare Krishna, no problem. In a lunch break, you know, for two minutes before you go back to your job. You know, so you will be a well balanced and situated and happy person. No, no, you should not abuse others. You should only do when they like it. <laughs> this is called illicit sex life. Illicit sex life means you do it when they don't like it. When they like it, then it's not illicit. Because not everybody likes it. <laughs> I could call day and night. There's nobody left from this preaching. <laughs> There's nothing left. Because you don't get disconnected from the material energy. So what to speak of Chitake to a certain wonderful personality who is just momentarily overpowered by you know by the grief of losing his son. So, uh, but even in his grief, he's still quoting the Vedas. <laughs> you know? When the Western people get grieving, then they say, I just can't, can't, And they say something which we don't want to quote here. <laughs> and they duck the whole thing. I have enough of this. Now I go out there and I do it my way. This is the mood of everybody in this Western world. I do it my way, always listening to some authority. I'm a free man. I'm in a free society, a democracy, we can vote. Do you want this idiot number one or that idiot number two? I like the idiot number two better. That's my vote. He looks like me because I'm the idiot number three. You know, it's like, ah, uh, you know, where's the freedom? This is the element that the preaching Prabhupada started with. Always attacking. First of all, you have no freedom. You are totally controlled. Second of all, you will serve. You are not the master. You will be always at service of somebody. This is easy to prove. I remember, you know, when I first day walked in the door, the first devotee preaching to me, used as it was customary in those days, of course, the most obnoxious example he could find, you know. So he told me, you know what? Yesterday I was in the street. I saw a lady walking with a dog. And you know what? The dog passed stool and she wiped his behind. I was like, that was the preaching those days, you know. <laughs> and I remember exactly hearing this. I was saying, why is he telling me that? There's nothing special about this. So what? I couldn't absolutely understand how bizarre the situation could be. You know, yeah. I didn't make the connection. What's up? I was saying, you know, so many people are walking on the streets and wiping the behinds of their dogs, so why is he telling me that? But actually, <laughs> the, the more you start to see things, you realize, what a position! What if we got ourselves into coming from the spiritual world, you know, having Krishna association and here we are serving, you know, humbly. You know, because actually what you get out of the dog is just in material terms even it's nothing. It's just, uh, you know, what's the dog doing for you? He gives you a feeling, once again. So then Prabhupada connected immediately uh, in America in his early days because people actually liked to accept gurus. That was some fashion in the 60s. 
There was a cartoon in a newspaper, two ladies down, you know, discussing on a cocktail party, you know, drinking champagne, and one said to the other, what can you guru do? You know, it was like, a, you had to have a guru. One was flying, another one was producing, you know, gold or ashes from his hand. Another one was, uh, you know, multiplying his forms. And everybody had some guru who could do something far out. That was kind of fashion, you know. Yeah. So Prabhupada said, well, this kind of guru and that kind of acceptance is the same thing like uh, accepting dog. What can you do? do? To come around. What is this going to explode? Is this coming? No, no, no. So everybody has to serve. That was Prabhupada's one of the basic things he was preaching. You must serve. So why not just choose who you want to serve? Yes, we have that freedom. Why not just serve the best? That's all. Prabhupada said, we are not so cheap. We are going to serve just anybody. We are going to serve the best. Since we have to serve anybody. That's one of the elementary things. And the best means in knowledge, not just sentimentally. Then what Prabhupada said, I gave you so many books to inform you about who are you serving, why are you serving. You know, this is important. No blind followership. Of course, Prabhupada said, still it's better blind followership as no followership, but it doesn't last for long. It's sentimentally based. Therefore, Chitakiri's argumentation doesn't stand really and doesn't last. Because uh, it's uh, actually inferior. It's inferior in value to the highest principle to surrender to Krishna. But we have to be careful with that. Because we can also justify lots of actions by saying, I'm serving Krishna. That's a bit dangerous. <laughs> they have the, uh, I heard even the word is quoting this. This is not coming from Prabhupada. You know. uh, the goal justifies the means. Well, that's Machiavelli, you know, that's Italy, you know, that was, he was a servant of the, uh, you know, of the dynasty which was starting Venice, and he was very, very, he was like the Western version of Chanyaka, but cannot be compared, so he was a quiet, a little materialist, but clever, so he was advising him, from him comes this few heavy things, might is right, and things like this, you know, and uh, the goal sanctified the need. No, in Krishna consciousness the means are only the goal. Because as you are engaged in devotional service, well that's only devotional service. And you are engaged in devotional service to achieve more devotional service. And when you qualify yourself for the highest platform of devotional service, then you can go and hold back to God. So the means are not something material, uh, you know, like I wash the flower. It's amazing, in a letter Prabhupada wrote to me thanking Mola, thank you for distributing 501 uh, books a week, you know. He includes this, that devotional service is absolute. But of course, on an absolute platform, there is also a gradation step. Prabhupada compared it in the, with the sugar cane. He said, it's sweet in the beginning and it's sweet at the end. But still it's the beginning and the end, <laughs> you know. There is, it's not the same, there's a beginning and there's an end, there's a middle, but uh, it's sweet. So he said devotional service is like that. There is still a gradation, even it's absolute. So certainly Krishna likes very much the distribution of books, of his books, and he likes very much when somebody is preaching, but that doesn't mean that the other, there was a warning issued, I perceived a letter like this, that uh, you should become arrogant. And I'm very grateful Krishna took me in such a roller coaster ride that I got a taste of everything. Big song guitar hero, you know, and then I end up in low profile management, you know, standing there thinking, who will cook this hundred years? Not me, because I don't know how to cook. Makes you quite humble, you know. You know, can you cook? Can you cook? 
Oh, he can cook. Thank you very much. You know, you become very grateful, even. You know, oh, the toilet is broken. Who can fix that? Of course, in the construction department, I found that I do it myself. Because amongst the devotees, you don't find many experts, construction people. But uh, there are also those, yeah. So that's what Prabhupada did. This is the benefit of old age also. It makes you very dependent. <laughs> you realize, well, you know, when you are young, you think, well, it's all one. Hey, let's do it. When you get older, you think, <coughs> who will do that? <laughs> you know, yes, I will do it, but uh, not today. You know, <coughs> you know that. This is the benefit. I mean, young people don't understand this. It's, it's just not impossible to understand. But material nature is designed like this, to humble us and to make us more and more aware how dependent we are on, on everything. Oxygen, water, just the elements. Totally dependent. And dependent on the body too. You know, without the body, what can you do? Just one of my brothers, he said, uh, I wrote to him, oh, so nice to meet you in a festival in summertime. He wrote back, no, no, you cannot meet me. Uh, I'm going to operation. It was the only time the guy had time to cut me open, so I, I cannot come to the festival. <laughs> oh, he can say, okay, I wish you a happy, happy cutting and happy opening, you know. Please write me back. By the way, Prananda Swami, so. <laughs> used to go to help me out. You know, you can see it's just coming. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, oh, operation was not so bad, but the, the anesthetic. Do you ever got an anesthetic, full glass anesthetic? It's such a poison, you know. It takes you one week to just recollect your senses, you know. It's just, <laughs> it's like somebody slammed you on the head. You know, you go, uh, uh. You know, this is anesthetic. It's pure poison, you know. You are poisoned for one week, at least. <laughs> and you go, Krishna, oh, where is he? <laughs> you know? <laughs> this is, oh, Prabhupada said, never bring me to hospital. <laughs> you know, but uh, still, the body brings these kind of situations. And that makes us more little bit more humble. So Chitra Kedu is certainly arguing in a Vedic style. But uh, it's not our line. You know, it's, it's admirable. 